This is the University of Hawaii Maui College, the college on Maui. So today, we're going to talk about chest tubes and chest tube systems. So what are chest tubes? Well, chest tubes are also called uh, thoracostomy tubes. Uh, chest tubes are long, semi-flexible plastic tubes. Uh, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. But chest tubes are inserted into the chest wall uh, so that they can drain collections of fluid or air from the pleural space. Uh, your lungs are surrounded uh, by a pleural space and there's really nothing in that pleural space other than just a little bit of fluid. Uh, and those two pleural linings uh, give the lungs lubrication uh, to move against the chest wall. Uh, but sometimes that pleural space can get filled up with air or blood or pus uh, and we need to use a chest tube uh, to drain that pleural space. Uh, so here's a picture of a chest tube in the pleural space. We see blood in the pleural space here. Uh, that's the lung right there. Uh, and so let's talk about pneumothorax. Here is a picture of a pneumothorax. Uh, and first, uh, we'll look over here at the normal lung. Normally, normally there is no air in the pleural space. There's really nothing in the pleural space other than a teeny, teeny, tiny amount of lubricating fluid that belongs in the pleural space. This pleural space helps keep the lung inflated. Uh, but if air, for some reason, gets into the pleural space, uh, this can collapse our lung. We can see our la lung has collapsed because some air has gotten into the pleural space. Uh, and this is called pneumothorax. Pneumo, air, thorax, the chest. All right. So air in the pleural space is pneumothorax. Uh, and this collapses the lung, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, and notice the inflated lung, the collapsed lung. We're going to look at some x-rays here in a second of all this. Uh, hemothorax is blood in the pleural space. Uh, and so here we see blood in the pleural space. And the lung has collapsed somewhat due to the blood. And we can have blood and air uh, in the pleural space as well. And there's a picture of the collapsed lung surrounded by blood in the pleural space. Uh, here's a chest x-ray. This is the normal inflated lung. Uh, air is black, stuff is white, uh, and since your air, lungs are full of air, they turn black on x-ray. We can see the ribs and we can see the heart. Uh, and over here is what's called an empyema. An empyema is pus uh, or purulence uh, in the pleural space. Uh, and so this is the uh, purulent fluid collection. This is the collapsed lung. Uh, so we use a chest tube uh, to drain the pleural space of either air or fluid, uh, and this reinflates the lung. Uh, I wanted to point out, though, the tip of the tube is usually pointing towards the collection. Uh, and so you'll see chest tubes point up uh, with pneumothorax uh, and down with a fluid collection because air goes up and fluid goes down. Uh, so don't be surprised if you see chest tubes pointing down into the pleural space uh, to drain fluids like blood. Uh, so if air fluid gets into the pleural space, uh, the lung can collapse. Uh, most people can endure this as a chronic process. Uh, but something to keep in mind is the concept of a tension pneumothorax. If air compresses in that pleural space, if it can get into the pleural space but no, has no way of getting out and we continue to add air and add air with each breath, uh, then this is going to compress the heart and the major vessels and this can be very lethal uh, in a matter of minutes. Uh, so here's a chest x-ray of a tension pneumothorax. Uh, and this is different than a simple pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax means the air uh, continues to be added and compressed and shifts the heart and the center mediastinum steinum across uh, the chest wall. So compressed air in the pleural space collapses the lung and it collapses the heart 
and the blood vessels. And this is what makes tension pneumothorax uh, so deadly, is because that air compressing on the heart does not allow the heart to fill with blood, and that means the heart cannot pump blood. Uh, something else you'll see on a tension pneumothorax, because it's shifted over, uh, you see our bronchus and where it divides in the two main stems uh, is shifted across the midline. And you can see that on the chest x-ray of a tension pneumothorax if you look very carefully. Uh, well, here uh, is a severe uh, tension pneumothorax x-ray. Uh, so this is our massive tension pneumothorax. Notice it's pushed the diaphragm way down uh, and it's pushed. Uh, the mediastinum and the heart across to the other side of the chest. Uh, and when the chest contents are compressed like that, uh, this is lethal. Uh, this will kill people very quickly. Uh, something you'll see if you ever come in contact with somebody who has a tension pneumothorax is their trachea uh, will be deviated away from the side of compression. Since everything's pushing uh, the chest, uh, contents to the opposite side. The trachea will deviate as well. Uh, and this is something that you can see uh, from across the room uh, if you have good eyes. Uh, and this tension pneumothorax was caused by rib fractures. If you look at this x-ray carefully, uh, you can see broken ribs. Uh, and these broken ribs have punctured the lung, and the lung has put air into the pleural space uh, but the air has nowhere else to go, and every time they inhale, they push and compress more air uh, into that pleural space. Uh, so a lot of times, these tension pneumothoraxes are caused uh, by rib fractures. Uh, and if we take a blow up, we can see uh, these fractured ribs uh, on the x-ray. Um, something else that you can see is subcutaneous emphysema. Subcutaneous means under the skin. Emphysema means air trapping. Uh, this isn't the disease emphysema uh, that's caused by smoking and other things. Uh, that is an airway disease caused by the lungs trapping air. A subcutaneous emphysema uh, is when air gets under the skin uh, and when you push on it, uh, you can hear it make little crackles and crepitus. Uh, and so sometimes you're going to have to put your hands on people and actually touch them uh, to feel uh, things like this uh, if it's not obvious. Uh, and here's a blow up of the x-ray. You can see uh, little air pockets under the skin. That's subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, subcutaneous emphysema uh, is not lethal. Uh, the rib fractures are not lethal unless they cause attention pneumothorax. Uh, this is a post-mortem x-ray. Uh, I think this is from the American College of Surgeons uh, from their trauma uh, web page. Uh, this tension pneumothorax is lethal because it's compressed on the heart. The heart is not able to fill with blood uh, and so the heart can't pump uh, and that's lethal. Uh, so the simplest form of a chest tube uh, is a needle uh, with an angiocath on it. Uh, the, tra the trauma web page recommends one uh, that's four inches long. Uh, anything uh, that will get in there uh, will work just fine. Uh, so needle decompression uh, is the emergency treatment for attention pneumothorax. Uh, a large bore needle of 14 or 16 gauge uh, with a catheter uh, can be used to decompress the pleural space uh, and that will cause the tension pneumothorax uh, that cause that air to have a place to be released uh, and then we just end up with a simple pneumothorax and that gives us some time. So for an emergency treatment of tension pneumothorax, a large bore 14, 16 gauge needle uh, with a catheter is inserted into the in second intercostal space uh, just above the third rib at the midclavicular line. Uh, the blood supply uh, that runs with the ribs runs underneath the rib. Uh, and so when you do any kind of needle procedure uh, that might uh, come in contact with a rib, we want to keep the needle above the rib. Uh, that's where the blood supply is not 
uh, the blood supply is beneath uh, the rib. Uh, so an emergency treatment of tension pneumothorax is a large bore 16-18 gauge needle uh, with the catheter inserted into the inter second intercostal space just above the third rib at the midclavicular line. Uh, I think a picture is helpful. Uh, and so uh, if this person having a tension pneumothorax, uh, the easiest and quickest way uh, to apply a life-saving treatment is to insert a needle right there, second intercostal space uh, of the midclavicular line. Uh, and so once the needle catheter has been inserted in the pleural space, uh, air will rush out. If you ever see this happen, you'll hear the air blow out of the needle. Uh, and so once that air is rushed out, uh, the chest has been decompressed, and now this gives us time uh, to insert a chest tube. Uh, and a chest tube is usually inserted uh, by a physician uh, at the bedside. Uh, the entry point for a chest tube uh, is the fourth or fifth intercostal space on the mid-axillary line. The mid-axillary line runs under your axilla, your armpit. Uh, so here's a picture of their armpit. And the surgeon is drawing uh, his entry point for a chest tube. And when people have chest tubes, you'll see them placed uh, in this area. Uh, this is a sterile procedure, uh, so once they're prepped and draped, uh, the procedure begins. Uh, your chest wall has lots of nerves and you don't tolerate chest pain very well. Uh, I assure you, these procedures are very painful. Pain control is essential uh, to uh, the successful performance of a chest tube insertion. Uh, I've drawn here uh, now the chest tube's on the opposite side. I've drawn here uh, a little marker showing you where the chest tube is. Hopefully uh, you can see that on x-ray. Uh, someone's had a chest tube inserted to re-inflate the lungs. Uh, after the chest tube is inserted, they're usually sutured into place uh, to be secured so they don't come out easily. Uh, and then we usually use Vaseline gauze around uh, the opening of the chest tube to seal the opening, prevent air leaks, that's important. Uh, and cover them up with Vaseline gauze and dress them uh, and you'll see all sorts of different ways to secure the chest tube. Uh, the earliest chest tubes were connected to nothing more than what's known as a Heimlich valve. So we've inserted the chest tube uh, and now here's the open end of the chest tube. Uh, and what do we do with it? Uh, well, there are lots and lots and lots of variations on how to drain and control a chest tube, and we're going to try to talk about uh, as many as I can. Uh, but the simplest thing to put on the end of a chest tube uh, is quite simply a one-way valve, a Heimlich valve. The original Heimlich valves uh, is just like cutting off the finger of a glove and putting a little hole in it, and you can blow out of that glove, uh, but air will not come back in. Uh, this is a more uh, complex, sealed and sterile version of that simple uh, glove valve. It's called a Heimlich valve. You'll also hear it called a check valve, uh, one-way valve. Uh, if you see this abbreviation somewhere on these PowerPoints, that means one-way valve. And these check valves, Heimlich valves, one-way valves, they're going to allow air or fluid to only go in one direction. Uh, these valves are not going to allow air or fluid uh, to enter the chest tube. And so this is the simplest thing uh, that we can put on the end of a chest tube, uh, but that's not usually uh, what you're going to see in a hospital. Uh, most likely you will find a very complex collection system uh, connected to the chest tube. Uh, and maybe uh, the system that you look like, use looks like this. Uh, or maybe the system you use looks like this. Uh, no matter what, no matter how complex, uh, they are all based on a three-bottle system. Uh, and so here's my cartoon of the three-bottle chest tube collection system. Uh, and I've now numbered the bottles one, two, and three. Uh, that won't necessarily be how they are numbered on other systems. 
Uh, but this is how I number them. Uh, and so number one is the collection bottle, and we can see fluid from the chest tube uh, dripping into the collection bottle. Uh, the second bottle is what's called the water seal. Uh, and this has all sorts of functions that we'll talk about. Uh, and then if we apply the system to suction, uh, we'll need some kind of suction control. And so the third bottle, the suction control, is there to make sure uh, that a consistent and precise amount of suction is applied to the chest tube system. Uh, so the first bottle in a chest tube collection system uh, is the collection bottle. Uh, and fluid from the chest tube is going to drain into the first bottle. Uh, and we can measure the amount of fluid. Uh, it's graduated, uh, so we can measure the amount of fluid in a collection bottle or a collection chamber. Uh, it's also important to note its color. Uh, normal pleural fluid is usually serous, uh, and so when it's yellow in appearance, that means serous, as in serum. Sanguinous uh, means blood, uh, and so when it's red, we call that sanguinous. Uh, and then sometimes it's a mixture of blood and serum, uh, and we call that serosanguinous. Uh, so in this system, uh, fluid from the chest tube enters the collection chamber. This is the collection chamber right here, just like the collection bottle. Uh, and notice the collection chamber is graduated, so we can measure the fluid volume very easily just by looking at it. Uh, notice in these systems that once one column is full, uh, fluid will then spill out to the next column. Uh, one of the reasons that they do this uh, is so that we can see uh, maybe the fluid collection starts uh, more sanguinous or bloody, uh, but over time, as the different columns fill, we can see changes in the appearance of the fluid uh, rather than the new fluid just being added to the old fluid. Uh, so one of the reasons we use this spillover system is so we can identify the changes in the color of the fluid over time. Uh, and so if you look carefully, uh, we see that 570 cc's of serous fluid uh, is in this collection chamber. Uh, so once again, here is the chest tube uh, draining into the collection bottle. Uh, and we can either put a one-way valve uh, coming out of this bottle, or uh, we can apply suction uh, to the bottle. Um, so here's our three-bottle system again. I explained the first bottle, fluid from the chest tube, is going to collect into bottle one. Uh, the second bottle is what's called the water seal. Uh, and air from the chest tube goes to the water seal. All right? So bottle one deals with collecting fluid from the chest tube. Uh, bottle two deals with identifying air coming from the chest tube. All right? So bottle two is the water seal uh, and the most important bottle of all. Uh, and the water seal is also called an air leak detector. Some of the sophisticated chest tube collection systems, they won't call it a water seal, they'll call it the air leak detector. Uh, it does a lot more than detect air leaks, uh, but don't be surprised if you see the water seal called an air leak detector. So here's a blow up of that bottle. Uh, the water seal of any chest tube system is going to detect air coming from the chest tube, and that's certainly something we expect. If we put the chest tube in for a pneumothorax and connect it to a water seal, uh, then we expect it to at least bubble uh, until the pneumothorax is resolved. Uh, but something else the water seal does, uh, at least in very simple water seals, is to act like a check valve. It also functions as a one-way valve uh, because air can bubble out like I showed you, uh, but air cannot get back in to the water seal. Uh, the water seal is usually set at two centimeters under water. That means the air coming in from the chest tube is submerged underwater uh, by about an inch, two centimeters. 
Uh, and that makes it simple because all the pressure that's required to get air out of the chest tube is just two centimeters of water. Uh, and so a water seal of two centimeters, notice our, uh, our uh, the air coming from the chest tube is submerged under two centimeters of water, uh, and so only two centimeters of water is required uh, of pressure for air to escape from the chest tube. Uh, well, here is a clinic in Ethiopia, Africa, uh, and this gentleman right here uh, is obviously in pain from this procedure, uh, and he has a chest tube, and it is connected to nothing more than a water seal. Uh, they do that because they don't expect too much fluid, uh, and so something this simple uh, will suffice. This is obviously a third world clinic uh, and a third world chest tube collection system, and I assure you this works just fine. Uh, but here is the water seal of this system, much more complex. And of course the water seal of any chest tube is usually set for two centimeters of water. And so if you look carefully at the uh, water seal of any system, uh, it usually requires two centimeters of water uh, for air to escape. Uh, and so the water seal of any chest tube system detects air coming from the chest tube. Well, to make things even more complicated, this system right here has what's called a graduated water seal. Uh, and that's the water seal for this system right here. Uh, we'll take a blow up of that uh, and draw a cartoon uh, to show you the graduated water seal of this system. Uh, so when a small amount of air comes from the chest tube, goes under the two centimeters of water, it's going to bubble up into the first slot uh, of the graduated water seal. Uh, if more air comes from the chest tube, uh, the, the chest tube, uh, if more air comes from the chest tube, air will trickle into the next slot. Uh, and so by using a graduated uh, a water seal, uh, we can judge whether uh, a little air is coming through the system uh, or more air is coming from the system. Uh, with the old water seal systems uh, that weren't graduated, it was hard uh, to explain from one person to the next shift exactly how much air uh, was coming from the chest tube uh, only a few hours ago. With the graduated systems, uh, we can actually consistently judge the amount of air coming from a chest tube. So here we have a lot of air coming from the chest tube, and it's making all five slots of the water seal bubble. Uh, another feature of the water seal is to measure the negative pleural pressure during inspiration. Uh, when, a, uh, when the thing is not connected to suction, uh, a simple water seal uh, can perform this task as, as someone inhales, the chest pressure is negative. That's what makes air rush into our windpipe, uh, and the pressure is negative in the pleural space, too. Uh, that means the chest tube is going to try to suck air back into the pleural space, uh, and we can measure that uh, with that column uh, that's above the water seal. Uh, this one has one, too. Uh, and so we'll take that and blow that up. Uh, and one, during inspiration, uh, the plural space is going to try to draw in air. Uh, and so when it's not connected to suction, uh, there will be a little float ball uh, when they inhale uh, that will come up this column. And during expiration, uh, the plural space is trying to push air out, uh, and the little ball uh, will go back down. Uh, so some of these advanced features, uh, they'll have a little inspiration pressure column uh, above the water seal uh, with a little float in it, and that float will go up and down uh, showing uh, inhalation and exhalation uh, when it's not set to suction, uh, for most systems at least. So this is another way 
uh, that the water seal functions. Uh, we can see the water uh, come up the column in a very simple system uh, during inspiration as well. So that's an advanced feature of the water seal. Well, the purpose of all this video is this right here. I get this question a lot. Uh, somebody will come home and sit down and ask me uh, this question right here. Uh, and the answer is always the same. That depends on the clinical situation uh, every single time. Uh, so should the water seal bubble? Well, is air coming from a pneumothorax that we're treating? If the chest tube is for a pneumothorax, then we can expect air to bubble in the water seal, uh, but we want that to decrease over time, uh, meaning that the leak is getting less. Uh, is the air leak coming from a leak in the chest tube system due to a bad connection uh, or a leak at the insertion site? Well, if we have the chest tube set to suction, uh, then a leak in the chest tube system, a leak at the insertion site, will make the water seal bubble. Uh, so if the system is set up for suction, a sudden increase uh, in bubbling in the water seal uh, can show that the chest tube has become disconnected. Uh, if it's not set, set to suction, uh, we can use our little inspiratory pressure gauge uh, to make sure uh, that the chest tube is properly connected. Well, when should the water seal stop bubbling? Well, the best case scenario is, well, is the air stopped because the punctured lung is now healed and our pneumothorax is all resolved and everything's all better? That's a great reason for the water seal to stop bubbling, uh, whether it's got suction or not. Uh, has the air stopped because there's a chest tube obstruction? Uh, well, do you remember tension pneumothorax? People with uh, chest tubes in them uh, can develop tension pneumothorax uh, if the chest tube uh, becomes obstructed. Uh, and so that's why it you need to understand how the system works and what it's being used for uh, and what was going on just a few hours ago uh, to be able to answer this question. Uh, so whether the water seal should bubble or not depends on the clinical situation every time. And the point that I want to make is that any changes in the chest tube output should be reported immediately. So we've talked about the collection system. We've talked about the water seal. Let's talk about suction control. All right. uh, before we do, uh, if a chest tube system uh, has no suction, uh, then it's automatically set to water seal. Right? So we don't really have to have suction on this system for the water seal to work. Uh, but for us to have suction on the system, we want to have control over the suction. And that's the purpose of bottle three, the suction control. Uh, here uh, is the third chamber on this system. Uh, and it's considered the suction control or the vacuum control. Uh, so a suction control chamber allows for the precise control of suction placed on any system. So when we take a chest tube system and we hook it up to our wall suction, uh, if we have a suction control device, uh, we will not be able to apply too much pressure, uh, too much suction on the chest tube system. And that's what uh, this is for. All right, so the air comes into the suction control from the chest tube system. Uh, and then the wall suction is, control, is connected to the outport. Uh, but notice there is a vent in the center. And this vent is also called the atmospheric vent. It's also called the safety valve of the suction system. Uh, and the atmospheric vent of the suction is usually submerged in 20 centimeters of water. All right, don't confuse this with the water seal. It's not the water seal. It's the suction control that's submerged in 20 centimeters of water. Notice here the atmospheric vent of the suction system is usually submerged in 20 centimeters of water. If you look at these very carefully, you'll see the suction control is set for 20 centimeters of water. Sure, there's going to be people that want it varied a little bit, uh, but 99 percent of the time you're going to see 20 centimeters of water for suction control. 
So let's talk about how that works. By placing the atmospheric vent underneath 20 centimeters of water and applying suction until the vent begins to bubble, then we are assured that it's a consistent suction of exactly 20 centimeters of water is applied to the chest tube system. Because this is under 20 centimeters of water, if we apply any more suction than 20 centimeters of water, uh, we're going to make it bubble. But this will still have precisely 20 centimeters of water of negative pressure applied to the system. 20 centimeters of water suction applied to the system. We can turn the water, we can turn the wall suction up full blast, uh, and it's only going to make the suction control bubble more. Uh, the chest tube is going to stay uh, completely consistent at 20 centimeters of water. So once the suction control vent bubbles, there's no more wall suction necessary. Uh, if the suction is less than 20 centimeters of water or turned off, the suction control will not bubble, uh, and that applies to any of the systems. If we do not place enough suction uh, on the system, uh, the control will not, the control chamber will not bubble. If we turn the suction completely off, the water seal will still function, uh, but the control chamber will not bubble. Uh, so when we stop the suction, the system, we say, is set to water seal. Uh, and so if there is no suction, there is no purpose uh, to a suction control bottle. So the suction control chamber should bubble when the proper amount of wall suction is applied. Once we've applied the proper amount of wall suction, uh, the suction chamber uh, will bubble, and we don't need to make it bubble anymore. If the suction control chamber uh, is not connected to suction, uh, then the suction control chamber will not bubble. Uh, but all that bubbles uh, it makes a lot of noise, uh, and that tends to keep people awake. Uh, and if you kick them over, it tends to be a problem. Uh, and something we see more and more used is something called a dry chest tube system. It's exactly the same, has a collection bottle and a water seal, just like every other system. Uh, but here it has dry suction control. See, here's our collection chamber. It's exactly the same. The water seal is exactly the same. But what's different with this system is what's called a dry suction control. And so we'll blow that up. Uh, it has a little thumb wheel on the side of the device. You can change this if you're ordered to. Uh, but usually it's set for 20 centimeters of water suction, which is negative 20 centimeters of pressure uh, water. Uh, and so this is a dry system, and we see it's set for 20 centimeters of water. Notice it's set for about 20 centimeters of water. We can't set it exactly. Uh, we just kind of have to guesstimate that that's about 20 centimeters of water, which is fine. Uh, and then under here is an indicator showing if the proper amount of suction has been applied. Uh, and so if we take that and draw a cartoon of it, uh, once the proper amount of suction has been applied, uh, an indicator, uh, a little bellows, will open up and come right out to the line. Uh, that tells us the proper amount of suction has been applied. Uh, if we don't apply suction to the chest tube system, uh, the bellows will go back in. Uh, and we'll just look at it one more time. So this is the indicator showing us that the proper amount of suction has been applied to the dry suction control. Uh, and so a dry suction control tube system has everything the same, but it just does not use water for suction control. Well, let's talk about this right here. Uh, this gentleman has suffered a rib fracture, uh, several rib fractures, uh, which have punctured his lung and caused him to have a pneumothorax. And here we can see he has severe subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, and so a lung, a, a rib that punctures the lung and causes severe subcutaneous emphysema, that can cause tension pneumothorax. And if this condition 
uh, results in tension pneumothorax, uh, that will be lethal. Uh, and he gets a chest tube uh, for this condition, uh, just like he should. Uh, and his, instead of being uh, connected to all the complicated systems that I've shown you, uh, he is actually uh, receiving third world health care. Uh, and you can tell that by the bed uh, and the fact that he's connected to an Erlenmeyer flask uh, with a little straw in it that sits under two centimeters of water. I think they use, uh, a, oh, there's a, a cork there uh, to control that. Uh, a very simple system uh, for this problem right here. Uh, and this is what he looks like afterwards. Uh, and so he's very grateful uh, for the care that he receives uh, from somebody named Dr. Erickson. And that's Dr. Erickson right there. Uh, he's the surgeon at Air Hospital in Ethiopia, Africa. Uh, and here he is striking a pose next to a sculpture uh, depicting severe subcutaneous emphysema uh, because rib fractures uh, that puncture lungs uh, that cause people to look like this is not uncommon uh, in Africa. Uh, and so for more medical adventures uh, in third world medicine, uh, be sure and check out this great website, uh, arahospital.org. Uh, the surgeon documents uh, a lot of cases on a daily basis on that website uh, and usually has something to say about why healthcare is so expensive in places other than the third world because uh, he runs this place on a shoestring budget. Well that concludes wind and waves and who that guy is right there. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture uh, and until next semester, aloha.